Hello, everybody. Welcome to the January 27th joint meeting, uh, January 27th, 2020 joint meeting between um, the uh, uh, City Services Committee and the Committee on Community Resources. I always get the two confused up. Thank you, Ryan O'Donnell, um, that uh, we're calling this meeting to order and we're going to take the roll call for both committees individually. First for uh, community resources, Laura, could you call the roll? Sure. Councillor Nash. Present. Councillor Jarrett. Here. Councillor Thorpe. Here. And Councillor Foster. Here. Okay, and now I turn it over to uh, my colleague and chair of city services. Laura, would you call the roll please? Sure. Um, Councillor Labarge. Present. Councillor Foster. I am also here. <laughs> Councillor Maori. I'm not present yet. And Councillor Quinlan. Here. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I need to announce that this meeting is being audio and video recorded. So, um, and um, we'll be, well, I have those in a minute. Um, now we are open to general public comment. And um, if you would like to make a public comment, I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand over in the, uh, by using the raised hand feature. I'm not seeing, do we see anybody for public comment? Also, I'm letting people know that um, later, you know, after each speaker, we're hoping to have some uh, uh, some question and answers with any of the speakers. And towards the end of the meeting, we would like to wrap things up with further questions and comments from the public. So, um, seeing no no raised hands for public comment. Um, Hello. Um, so let's now move on to uh, approval of the minutes for community resources for our October 26th, 2020 meeting. Could uh, somebody make approve. a motion on that from community resources? <laughs> motion to approve. We have a second. Second. Excellent. Uh, any discussion on the minutes? I I also think that uh, Councillor Jared is going to keep himself from this. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. I was just going to abstain, but uh, maybe I should just recuse entirely. Uh, yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you weren't uh, there, so sure. sure. I'll I'll recuse. Okay. So, um, uh, Laura, can you uh, give us a roll call? Sure. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. And Councillor Foster. Yes. Okay. Minutes are approved. Uh, at this point, we do we ask for updates and announcements from committee members. Doesn't sound like we have any, which is great because we have a really um, packed agenda here. Um, okay. Now on to the main part of the meeting here, which is we are having a meeting on the topic of housing security um, that we as counselors have been hearing a lot about concerns about folks in and around downtown from our houseless community, concerns about the services they're receiving and, and their plight during the pandemic. We've also been hearing concerns about people who um, uh, may be facing a eviction and what kind of a, what kind of services are available to them? Uh, the lineup of speakers tonight is to help address uh, those questions and and um, um, and help us frame how to move forward. Um, the speakers we have tonight uh, are Pamela Schwartz, um, Jay Sachetti, Dana Bouton or Dana Bouton and Jay Levy. Um, 
we also, I'd like to make a motion at this time, or I would like to have a motion from the floor to recognize Pastor Steph Smith, who I hope will be joining us for um, part of uh, Pamela Schwartz's presentation. Move to recognize Steph Smith. Second. Okay, excellent. And so we're gonna need to do this for both committees. So mm -hmm. community recent, so uh, Laura, could you do a roll call for um, uh, community resources? <laughs> sure, Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. And Councillor Foster. Yes. Okay, great. And I'll turn this over to my colleague, uh, Councillor Labarge, the Chair of City Services, to do Thank this. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Laura, could we do a um, roll call vote on this, please? I think we just need a motion and a second to recognize um, Steph move Smith. To move to recognize Steph Smith. Second. All in favor? Yeah. Any discussion? Okay. Yeah. All right, let me get the roll call. Okay, Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Maori. I'm not sure if she's joined yet. And I'm not hearing her. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Okay, great. And um, all right, so I see uh, that we have a former councillor, Pamela Schwartz, here to speak from the Western Massachusetts Network to end homelessness. Um, that uh, Pamela is going to need to be out of our meeting by six o'clock and, um, and she's hoping to have uh, Pastor Smith join her during her presentation. Um, Pamela, are you out there? I, I am, I'm here, I'm here. Oh, there you are. <laughs> this is so strange with Zoom, I don't know who's here. So, um, uh, and, thank you for uh, having me. Oh, thank you and, and, um, and that uh, we're, we're really honored to have you here and that um, what we're looking, at, we've, we talked about this on the phone, we're really hoping that you can kind of help frame uh, what's going on for our, uh, our houseless po population and the services that are out there and, and, and uh, what we can do as, a, as counselors in a city to, um, to help here. So okay. you have the floor okay. and is Steph in the room? Yes, she is. Can we get her? Um... Yep, I'm here. Okay, great. Okay. All right. All right. You guys have the floor. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. So thank you. Good evening, everyone. Nice to see you or see your names. Either one. It's all a pleasure. Um, I thought what I would do is take a few minutes and, and um, describe what the network does and, and the sort of umbrella that it offers in this work. The people who you're going to hear from after me, including uh, Pastor Steph most immediately are going to be better at giving you an on the ground description of what's happening in the communities. Although what the network is, is a funnel from on the ground to region and to state and even to national advocacy. So let me just say in a, first as an introduction, the network, its mission is to prevent and end homelessness with a housing first approach that centers racial equity. That is our mission. We cover the four counties of Western Massachusetts. We are state funded. Um, we are, it's a very streamlined operation. I am the one staff person of, of this network. And I, I help facilitate the convenings that include somewhere between 400 and 500 organizations across the region and in also including state, rep, uh, state agencies and legislators and mayors. Our Mayor Narkowitz is part of our leadership council. Um, our, our, the, there's I, Every single person you're going to hear from tonight is part of our network and is we're all very connected with each other. Um, I'm, as, I, I don't wanna be too presumptuous in rolling by the word housing first. So I just am gonna take five seconds to define it. And housing first in effect means the best and most effective response to homelessness is housing with accompanying support systems, whatever one needs to help stabilize. But the first thing we do is house people. And that is distinct just to, 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 to create context for that concept. That's distinct from a concept that became um, disavowed data on a database as, as effective, which is quote unquote, housing ready. 
So with, what sort of sprung the shelter industry into, its, uh, into uh, something that was much larger than anyone ever envisioned it would need to be is a concept that, oh, before you get into housing, you've got to get everything worked out. If you need mental health treatment, if you need substance use treatment, if you need a job, if you need a GED, get it all lined up and then go into housing. And that has been disproven, data-driven, that it is not as effective for stable housing by a long shot than housing first. So I just wanna make that very explicit that that's what drives all of our work. Um, it is, drives the national work on this issue, it drives state work and it drives us regionally. So the network has this umbrella. It has this leadership council that's made up of our state legislators, our mayors, our leaders across every sector, community colleges, hospitals, career centers, other workforce development, and of course our housing and shelter providers. And then we work on committee level by population, youth, individuals, families, veterans, and career services that spans it all. This is, we convene all of the various entities that are working across these sectors by subpopulation every month. We talk about what's going on across the region, how we can brainstorm, how we can problem solve. One of the things that sprung up through this, through the pandemic is, is a task force, is the Western Mass COVID-19 Task Force for Housing First that, is, that has been meeting since August, every two to three weeks, that's made up of these, of legislators. It was actually inspired by legislators who wanted to know what was happening in their communities. So we are convening in each community from Springfield to Holyoke to Northampton, Amherst, Greenfield, Pittsfield, North Adams. They're reporting in on what's happening on the ground in their communities, what's where the shelter capacity is at, where the need is, what policies are needed, that, where what's happening around testing, around now vaccinations, and other issues that are arising. The other thing the network does is it works on a policy level. We worked very hard to create more tenant protections during the pandemic. Um, we had some success, not as much as we wanted. We were really after the Housing Stability Act on a state level. Instead, we got some additional tenant protections. I want to I want to sort of um, push forward and just bring to you what's happening on the eviction level right now statewide. One of the things that we did win, and by we, I mean all of us who are working to protect tenants. One of the things we did win in the FY21 budget that was passed on December 31st is additional tenant protections against eviction so that if there's a rental assistance application pending that the uh, eviction process can be continued, it can be delayed, and a couple of other things. In addition, relevant to this point, is we won uh, the, the requirement that the trial courts report to the legislature what's happening in evictions during this pandemic. They just released the most recent report um, that uh, for the first report, I should say, for the month of December. And in it, we learned that there were 449 executions for possession statewide in the month of December alone. That's just take the executions of possession are the very last, it means that the sheriff is coming and putting your stuff on the street. That's happening now in the state. Um, I can tell you that I can also tell you based on that report. And when I stop talking, I'm going to put in the chat the link to the network blog, which I strongly encourage you all to join if you wanna stay connected to what's happening on housing policies on a state level that we can connect to and bring our Western Mass voice to impact, please join us. So I will. that link will go in there. There's a big orange subscribe button for you to join. But um, the other thing to know, to really notice it from this report is it will tell you that in the month of December in all the eviction cases that were filed, 0.9% of tenants had legal representation, 0.9% up against 71% of landlords who had representation. I know this council has weighed in on the right to counsel on a statewide level. I thank you. I'm giving a big nod to you and your being heard on this. We can see how vital this is to have to pass at a statewide level when we're looking at 0.9% having representation. The other thing I can share with you, thanks to the data collection work of the Springfield, Springfield No One Leaves, which is also our anchor organization for Homes for All Massachusetts Coalition. She has, Rose Webster Smith, the director, has poured into the data on eviction filings to bring to us in Western Massachusetts some numbers that since the eviction moratorium was lifted in, on October 17th, there have been over 1,200 eviction filings in Western Massachusetts alone. 
Um, the I don't hold on. I'm going to just I need to shrink you I need to shrink you. It's a very weird expression, but that's what I need to do um, because I want to get to the most this blog post that I'm about to give to you so I can give you the numbers in Hampshire County. There have been 79 eviction filings um, in in Franklin, 59 in Berkshire, 148 and in Hamden County, 873 eviction filings with the city of Springfield holding 542 of them. So that's happened since the eviction moratorium has been lifted. Um, this is deeply concerning, obviously. And that's just, just to be clear, that's just the non-payment of rent cases. That's it, not, not for cause. I mean, it is just non-payment of, not for other causes. They might be for cause and they name the cause as non-payment of rent, but it's just non-payment of rent. We know we have uh, our our raft raft is the eviction uh, is the eviction prevention resource where you get rental that that's the statewide program that gives you rental assistance. We know our wayfinders you might be familiar with it it's our regional housing authority that does a whole lot in our region and covers Hampton and Hampshire County. They are right now getting over 400 applications for rental assistance each week right now the wait for those rental applications to be processed is roughly six to eight weeks. So our crisis response is in effect not able to be a crisis response right now due to the demand. I will say on the brighter side that the, uh, the state housing agency, Department of Housing and Community Development has simplified some of the eligibility rules to make applications move more smoothly. They've also added staff. Wayfinders has hired 60 people. Um, they're, they're working very, very hard to speed up this process, but it isn't fast enough and everybody would agree the system is overloaded. Community legal aid has, all, has received substantial resources from the governor's eviction diversion initiative to assist tenants um, who are facing eviction. And I, and I don't know whether there's anyone from, I don't know whether you have anyone from CUNY Legal Aid on the docket, but I will provide that a, a link. We tried. To, okay. <laughs> well, so they, so um, it, it, you know, they, they're, they're hiring like crazy. They're working really hard to meet the demand. Um, it's, it's an uphill battle, as you can see with 0.9% of tenants being represented based on the month of December. But there is, but there is a phone, there is a phone number to call. And, and that's very important. And I'll make sure you've got that. Um, so I, I think our, our work, you know, we, we worked very hard as a, as a Western Mass voice in the network to bring to bear our urge, sense of urgency around uh, tenant protections. And that is continuing in this legislative session. We have fantastic legislators, as you know, on this issue, Senator Comerford and Representative Sabadosa. They are front and center on this. They are in our court working very, very hard. And we are going to continue to call upon them um, to continue to push that whether where there will be new legislation filed to increase housing stability. So I'm asking you now to join us in that, in your, you know, this council and as individuals, we need your voices. Um, we, and I know, and people here, I'm going to, I think I'm going to wind up this sort of big picture um, and move to the community portrait here, because those here on this call are really in a better position to provide you closer to the ground in Northampton, except everything that I'm talking about is in effect extremely close to the ground in Northampton. It's just something that we need to bring to the state house in our advocacy. So with that, um, I could pause, maybe I'll pause for questions about what I've just said, and then I want to turn it over to Steph to bring you um, information about Northampton in particular. Well, you know, uh, so um, how about let's let's go to Steph, okay. and um, and then the the way I'd like to do things is then we'll have counselors ask some questions for clarification, and then we'll we'll open it up to question and comments from the public. Great. Thanks, Steph. Thank you, Pamela, and thank you all for this invitation to be here. Um, so I'm Stephanie Smith. I'm the pastor and one of the founders of Cathedral in the Night. So we are an outdoor church. We meet um, in front of First Churches each Sunday night for a, uh, I should say, before COVID, for a brief service um, that is very welcoming and accepting of everyone and very progressive. Um, and then we work with community partners and churches from all over New England to provide uh, the community meal that day. 
uh, when we started in, it's been 10 years since we started, which I cannot believe. And so grateful for the city for inviting me to lots of meetings that uh, I never expected as a church to be invited to. And so really grateful for this town. Um, cathedral wouldn't exist without a place like Northampton for it to thrive in. Um, so we started 10 years ago, we picked Sunday, not because it's a church day, but because it was at that point, the only day that there wasn't a meal in town. Now we have a little bit of a gap with Fridays. Um, so we've been doing this for 10 years. Um, we are not a social service agency, but we, our mission is one to create that safe space for people to connect on a faith base, but also um, as an opportunity to join together for members to share resources um, and, and, and as an organization to help people connect to services that are available to them. Uh, if you've ever had to um, navigate the system, it's very complicated and overwhelming. And it's very, very easy for people to give up or to opt out because things didn't go smoothly somewhere along the line. So our hope is to give hope, to uh, empower one another to um, that have been through um, different agencies to help other people also navigate those agencies. Um, I work really hard to get to know all the agencies in town so that I can be a bridge builder to helping people get um, the help that they need. Uh, we do fill in a little bit of gaps here and there for things that um, aren't easy to um, negotiate. Like, you know, if someone comes to me and says they need medication, I'm not going to make them jump through 300 hoops in the meantime to get that. We try and jump in if we can afford to do that for people while we're connecting them to, to an organization that's bigger, that can help with bigger um, issues and the underlying causes of these problems. So that's in a nutshell of what we do. Um, I wanted to share a brief story with you just to give you an idea of, you might be thinking, what is, why, why is Steph talking? Why a church, you know, um, and why, what we kind of offer. So I wanted to share this story. I've gotten permission to share this story. I'll never share something that I don't have permission for, but uh, a member of our, um, our community who had come for a long time was struggling with um, addiction and um, then just sort of disappeared one day, which happens. And you've probably noticed this too. You'll stop seeing someone that was downtown all the time and sort of wonder where they are. We deal with that a lot, but um, so finally out of the blue, thank God for Facebook, some, <laughs> this person found me and uh, sent me this message. Um, and I'll just kind of paraphrase it. He uh, shared that he had been homeless on and off in the area for eight years, um, both in Northampton, Holyoke and Springfield, and that he was really struggling. Um, he spent some time in shelters and slept outside for four and a half uh, years, winters. Uh, during that time, he always looked forward to coming to our service. Uh, we often sing, we would always sing this song at the beginning of every service, welcoming everybody. And he talked about how much that meant to him. But he says, there were times when I was at the end of my road mentally and physically, and I came to your service, it completely changed my evening on multiple occasions. You always made me feel wanted and cared about. Uh, this was years ago now, but he um, then was able to go to a halfway house um, and he's now been sober for a long time. But he shared with me um, that uh, he had had several overdoses uh, opiate overdoses. And um, one night he had an opioid overdose. And one of our um, officers, um, Adam, who is on the, um, the DART team, uh, found him and took care of him, brought him to the hospital, spent the whole day with him, uh, getting him into a treatment facility um, and making sure that he was okay. Um, and he just wanted to thank Adam, I know he sent a message to Adam as well and to me to just say thank you for not giving up on me, for always seeing the good in me. And that's a big part of what we do is, is reminding people that no matter what they've gone through, because to end up outside, um, you've probably had a lot of trauma and traumatic things happen to you. Um, and certainly being outside um, adds more trauma to, uh, to your life. Um, it is not easy thing to do. So um, that's a lot of what we do. We're so grateful. Um, Councilwoman um, Karen Foster is now working with us through the Kiwanis Club to help provide, because um, COVID has certainly thrown as all of our lives into a 
into a tizzy. Um, access to food has become harder for us with churches not being open. And so um, Karen has graciously helped us organize our vegan option. Uh, we also work with, a, I'm a member of the Downtown Northampton Association. They've been great in providing food uh, through the Feed the Frontlines program, which has been a huge gift to us. Um, and so ways that you might wanna be involved in non-COVID times, come by and hang out. Um, someday that day will be here. Um, everybody is welcome. Uh, if you ever want to provide food, we would love that as well. Um, but we often reach people who aren't being reached by other agencies um, because the bar to, to participate is so low. We're outside, just walk over. Um, and so we really work to try and help connect them to other agencies. I wanna say a few things in response to what Pamela talked about, especially in, uh, in regards to evictions. What those numbers do not take into account is people who aren't on a lease that are couch surfing with other people. So what I am seeing a lot of this winter especially is a lot of people who um, lived with a family member or a friend or couch surfed and have no legal rights to their apartment. And so, when that person's name is on the lease and they're tired of whatever, um, or just want their space back, or maybe because of COVID or feeling more concerned, they have no rights and they're outside. And some of them now in town are living out of their cars, um, are homeless for the first time, which is overwhelming, especially to be homeless in the winter. Um, we do not have a warming center right now. Um, and that's a real concern. Um, it's one thing to be outside overnight. It's a whole nother thing to be outside 24 hours a day. Um, and I guess the other thing I'd, I'll end with um, is just to say, I think there's a lot that we do really, really well in town. Um, but I think one of the growing edges for us could be ways to engage the whole community. And, and um, Councilman Nash, you had said how people are really concerned and seeing the increase of homelessness. Um, I think we need to do a better job at talking about how difficult it is um, for some people to want to go to a shelter. Um, gracious that ServiceNet has been able to um, increase capacity, but um, as, as Pamela said, it really needs to be housing first. Uh, to be in a shelter can be really overwhelming, especially with COVID. People are concerned about getting sick. But even before COVID, um, it, there's a lot of, um, it's, it's hard to be in a small space with a lot of people who may also be struggling. Um, so a lot of people are afraid to be a part of the shelter, no matter how safe ServiceNet and other agencies make their facilities. There's a barrier for people. I hear from a lot of women that it's um, very uncomfortable to be in a space that has men there because of maybe damage that's happened in the past. Um, I would love to see a women's shelter um, that's not uh, focused just on domestic violence um, in the area. Um, but there's a lot of barriers that make it really hard for people to be in that congregate living. Um, and I think that is something we can all kind of lean into and figure out ways um, to help with that. And I, and I know that this, you know, this city is always looking for ways to expand affordable housing and has done an amazing job for such a small town. I just want to lift that up as I'm just so, so much gratitude for all the work that you've done to make that possible in our town. But I can go on and on, but I won't, um, um, but glad to answer any questions um, and just grateful for this time and this conversation. Uh, so thank you to both uh, Steph and Pamela for uh, the testimony you've provided. And um, I, I'm gonna ask other counselors at this time if they have uh, some follow-up questions around um, uh, what they've heard. Let me see if I can see folks. Let's see how do I get in here. All right, I see Councillor Labarge. You have the floor. You're on oh, mute. I think you're muted. Now it looks. Okay, I think it's. Yep, you're with us. Sarah, how do we get a hold of you. What's your contact telephone number? For me? Yeah. Um, so you, we have our own website, cathedralandnight.org. Um, my email, or the easiest email is pastor, P-A-S-T-O-R, Steph, S-T-E-P-H, Smith, S-M-I-T-H, at gmail.com. And we have a Facebook page too. Okay. 
I, uh, I know Adam very, very well. And he's just fantastic, you know, and hearing what he did for that young man of staying with him all day long, he should be, you know, really commended about that because that is so valuable in somebody's life. And I'm so glad you're here today because I've learned about what you do with um, Cathedral Church and so forth. And I know through um, Counselor Karen Foster, she told me a little bit about people bringing like cookies or whatever on Sundays and so forth like that. And um, she talked me into that because I hearing you today, it's amazing what you're trying to do for our community. And I thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And it, it does take so many people to pull off what we do each week. So thank you for being a part of that. Yeah. You're welcome. And um, our former counselor, Pamela Schwartz, I'm so glad to see you here. And I really enjoyed working with her. And um, Pamela, I'm shocked on seeing these numbers on people being evicted and so forth. I've never seen these numbers and it's unbelievable here. Unbelievable. And I think a lot of people- On the brighter side, I mean, the potentially brighter, potentially. I mean, we have a lot of pushing to do. We do have with Pres President Biden has extended the CDC moratorium until the end of March. Thank God. However, However, the number, the eviction number, you know, the, 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 the current moratorium, that's, that's half where we need to be is an extension. And the other half is we need, really need to strengthen it and make it more comprehensive. Because at this point, it, it only kicks in at the point of execution. So the tenants have to go through an entire eviction process before it's stopped. If the tenant submits a declaration signed under the pains and penalties of perjury, uh, fulfilling certain qualifications around non-payment and COVID-19 related which is obviously a very significant barrier for many tenants for many for many reasons, having nothing to do with whether or not they are truth telling, but just because it's a scary thing to sign something under the pains and penalties of perjury, much less if you're an undocumented person and there's all sorts of barriers. So this is why there still is, are these evictions even in the face of the moratorium? However, it is a good thing that it's been extended and apparently he's, you know, he's listening to people um, around the need to strengthen it. He, the National Low Income Housing Coalition is working very hard with on the administration, with the administration. So hopefully it will get stronger. So that's that's the hopeful part in the sea of way too many people who are slipping through the cracks and who are actually getting thrown out on the street during this pandemic. I thought, Pamela, that there was a law in place that during the winter months, a landlord could not go ahead and evict a person. So how yeah. are they doing this? I don't understand this and telling them they got to be out by March. It's well, they just, they can file their eviction right now. The only barriers to eviction based on state law are, uh, are if there's a pending rental assistance application, it can yeah. be case is suspended. And there is uh, the, the legislature also passed a law that it is part of the FY21 budget that requires a very prescribed notice to quit with particular language advising people of the CDC national moratorium and advising them must advise where to find rental assistance. So if that language isn't in the notice to quit, the case can be dismissed. Right now, those are the only two protections. And there's no protections whatsoever on federal or state level for homeowners and to prevent against foreclosure. So there's a lot, a lot of gaps. Thank you so much, Pam. You're welcome. See you. Thank you. I'd like to recognize uh, Councillor Jarrett. Thank you. And, and thank you, Steph and, and Pamela. Um, so great to hear the, your report. Um, so I wanted uh, two things. One, you, the city is working hard on getting the resilience hub, uh, which will function as a warming center. Um, and is there, is there any way we can assist in getting a temporary warming center get set up this winter? Um, and the other question was in general, you know, how can the city assist providers? And I know Pamela, uh, we've talked about, uh, you know, getting a dedicated staff person to coordinate and advance uh, resources and options around housing. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on those two things. 
Steph, do you want to take the warming center question? Yeah, um, there is there is a potential space for a warming center that's been offered up, but there's no at this point there's no one to organize it or staff it, um, and so that's been the conversation with different agencies in town. Is it can someone kind of spearhead it? Um, I think we could find volunteers, but without some direction and some oversight um, from some agency that would be willing to make sure people are being safe. And it, it's also it's COVID, you know, it's, it's a scary time to try and ask people to be inside with one another. Um, so I think those are some of the barriers. Um, but the biggest thing would be, you know, do we need, you know, we do need someone to oversee it. And I don't know if that would need to be an agency or how that would work. But um, I know the United Way and other organizations had a lot of people volunteer. And especially when like the, the shelter was up at the high school, there were lots of volunteers. So I don't think Volunteers would be necessarily the, is the issue, but certainly someone to oversee the space and oversee volunteers and things like that is, is where we're at. Thank you. Um, and um, there was, you did have a second, you did have a second question. Councilor Jared had a second question. Yeah, oh, um, just, sorry. you know, we had talked about um, the ha having like a dedicated staff person to coordinate in the city to coordinate um, housing options and uh, I, I mean just, I was, just the general question was you know how can the city assist providers better I mean I, I actually think the city's on the path with this resilience hub I mean I, I think that is you know that's where it feels like the best match for city resources to um, to be going because they're going to be partnering with a provider and uh, and there will presumably be staff and resources. They, I mean, sort of, I, I see the city as more of a funnel and a support than I do as a staffing entity, an additional staffing entity for this purpose. I, because there's so much work already going on in the community. So I think the key is, is supporting the infrastructure that's already exists. And then of course, creating this new infrastructure through the resilience hub. But what it doesn't, um, so I, I just think, I think that there's, there is continuing on the path, frankly, that um, that the city's currently on, and just you know continuing to make that resilience hub the top priority that it is is great. Yeah, and I, I would add to that that we do have the next step meeting that um, is now run by Keith, um, so that brings together Pamela and I are both a part of that, and and most of the agencies in town are a part of that. Um, so that's a great resource and a great way that the city does support all of us. Um, I mean, the reality is we just need more, more people doing this work. Um, you know, I'm grateful that ServiceNet provides case managers and um, Elliot Housing, uh, Elliot Homelessness Service, I'm messing that up, but Jay's on here and he'll correct me. Uh, sorry, I'm spacing on that, but they, you know, Brendan and, and other um, case managers and social workers, but there's just never enough. I mean, their caseloads are way too high all the time. So um, it's just, it's just a matter of, you know, there's a need for more social workers as well to help people navigate through the system. And, and I'm not saying that's the city's concern. I'm just saying it is a concern and I'm not sure who would pick, pick that up, but um, yeah. Okay. Uh, Councillor Jared, any other questions? Uh, Sorry, no. I cut you off Thank, there. thank <laughs> you both. Yes, thank you. Is there um, any, oh, uh, I see Councillor Foster has a question. You have the Thanks. floor. Thank you, Councillor Nash. It's, it's just a quick follow up uh, with you, Pamela. Um, thank you, Steph and Pamela, both for being here. My question, Pamela, is I know how many small landlords are relying right on, on the rent money to keep their own homes. And you had mentioned, so there's no foreclosure. I was just wondering if there's anything available during this time of the eviction moratorium also to help people uh, facing potential foreclosure as well? Yeah, that, it's a great question. Um, the, the one thing I can say is that RAFT actually, one of the changes reforms made to the RAFT program is to create what's called quote unquote, a landlord door. So in other words, as opposed to be relying on tenants to submit the application, landlords can apply directly for RAFT to assist in the tenant's back payment that's due and in that way protect their asset. Um, there is not 
there is not for, I mean, there, there was in the earlier iteration when there was this, the eviction moratorium, there was forbearance on loans that was provided um, and that, and there was a lot of advocacy to um, extend that and strengthen it through the Housing Stability Act, which was not adopted in this last session, unfortunately. So there's no explicit foreclosure protection, but for small landlords, there is, um, there, there, for any landlord, there is the option of seeking rental assistance on behalf of their tenants. That's what exists right now. Thank you. Okay, um, is there, the, the counselors have had their, their shot at things. Is there anybody in the room? Oh, Councillor Thorpe has a question. Thank, thank you, Councillor Nash. And thank you, Pamela and Pastor Steph for being here this evening. Um, Pamela, just so I know, um, earlier you mentioned those facing eviction that there was, was it 9% has representation? You said 0. 0.9. 0. 0.9. 0. 0.9% 0. 0.9. of Less those have 1%. representation. Mm -hmm. Is that because there is a lack of uh, public counsel for these individuals? Is it- um, There's so, there, the, the barriers, I mean, they're, they're trying to, uh, there is a legal assistance program that was part of the governor's initiative and they're working very hard. Uh, those that were, you know, community legal aid here in our region, hiring. Uh, there's the whole. There's a creation of the um, COVID-19 legal eviction help. I'm going to get it wrong, um, but it, there's an acronym that is specifically to create a more access for legal assistance in during COVID-19. And what I think that number shows, first of all, the program is in its early stages, it's starting up. So hopefully there'll be, the numbers will grow of, in that percentage of tenants of representation. But the other thing it demonstrates is, is the gaps. I mean, is that, is that a tenant may get, you know, this is a virtual world, we're in the pandemic, they're experiencing trauma in their unstable home. I mean, in their housing being threatened, they're getting a piece of paper, however they're getting it, they may or may not know what it means. They may or may not even know whether to seek assistance. They, now, the good news, again, is that it, the legislature did pass a law that requires certain language to be in the notice to quit that in theory would refer that tenant, would advise the tenant of where to call. And yet still, right, there is, there is, there is just, there's gaps in, in, the, in the receipt of information, in the, in the ability and capacity to act on it and then in actually obtaining it because the program is still starting up and they're gonna be, it's just not going to be big enough to cover the level of demand that's out there. So, so it's a yes, no answer. I mean, yes, there's an increase in resources. No, it's not enough. This is why we have 0.9% of tenants represented. Hopefully that number will increase. That's certainly everyone's intention, but it really brings to bear how critical it is to have laws that protect people's stability period, out of the gate, where we're not putting tenants through this during COVID-19, during the risk of the th health threat of this pandemic and adding to the trauma that everyone's experiencing. That's why we need something like the Housing Stability Act that ensures that tenants are safe and landlords are protected. They, they are not facing foreclosure either. And that we just stop the presses on this process. Because once you're in the realm of receiving a notice to quit, you are in the danger zone of being evicted period. You're just, there's too much risk. Thank you, Pamela. Uh, Councilor Quinlan. I just, I just wanted to ask kind of a nuts and bolts question about kind of following up on what Councilor Thorpe was talking about with legal representation, because Pamela, you were talking about that a, a, a tenant that's that's specifically having trouble because of the pandemic has to sign a statement. Um, do they, they do they? I mean, in theory, I, I would think a person would need legal support to do that. Even just to be able to do that requires something that you're telling us that 99% of people don't have. Yes, that is true. And I will tell you, part of what the legal aid that is provided does guide people through the CDC form that says check these boxes, sign here. This is how you submit it. So very, uh, it's an excellent point and absolutely true. Legal counsel and, and counsel, if not you know a trained lawyer, but some level of assistance is totally, uh, in many, many instances, I, I mean, I don't have hard data on you know how many tenants can manage it, how many tenants need help, but the, inst the, uh, the instinct of this is a help-oriented moment is real. And certainly 
the additional funding that's setting up this program, this legal assistance program is intended to steer people. It's, it's intended, it's literally, they're hiring, Clique Legal Aid is hiring staff to help people get through the rental to the raft application. It's a complicated application. It's mm -hmm. many long. They're trying to simplify. That's the, new, the newest reforms are simplifying. I just got a data point from Wayfinders that the biggest single barrier is that 50% of the applications are, are have missing data. 50% of the applications have missing data. And so it takes help. I mean, these people are in, we're all in some version of trauma. And if you imagine housing stability on top of it, it, it they just require help. So yes, to get that CDC moratorium uh, filed, very, it very typically requires assistance. And that's the whole nature of this legal assistance program that people are working very, very hard to get up and running. But again, we're not, it's not safe enough. It's just not enough. Period, hands down, it's not enough. Well, thanks to you both uh, for this uh, for this lesson. I, I appreciate it greatly. Thank you for having us. Any any more counselors? I'm looking through my screen here. I do see a raised hand. I see uh, a Ward Three const constituent, Robert Eastman, has his hand raised. Robert, you have the floor to ask a question or make a comment. Great, thank you. Hi everyone. I'm Robert. Um, I haven't paid rent since June and I uh, have not finished filling out my raft application. <laughs> um, I'm not going to talk about that though. I actually just wanted to ask um, Pam a little bit more about housing first. Um, I keep hearing that that's the solution and yet a lot of the conversation besides the part about protecting people who currently rent or in homes has focused on day shelters, shelter services. I'm just wondering, practically speaking, like what housing first means and what systems we have in place for getting people into housing currently. Great question, it's a big question and I'm mindful of the number of speakers you've got here. So I'll just try to give you a thumbnail and happy to follow up. Um, so, so there is HUD, our federal housing partner um, has, has an entire program based on Housing First where it funds, it provides uh, billions of dollars across this, the country, but here in our region alone, um, several million dollars to, attend, to address homelessness with a Housing First approach. And that means in this instance that they have, they fund what's called permanent supportive housing units um, where it's housing with support services that come for the for, that come with it for those who are most um, at risk of or who experience chronic homelessness and have the highest vulnerability. That's like one lane of what it means to do housing first. That you have there's it's very I, I'm very it's tempting to get in the weeds and I'm determined not to. But there's a whole system. It's a coordinated entry system where you get assessed if you're chronically homeless. You get on a by names list where you get prioritized based on your vulnerability. You get into this precious resource of permanent supportive housing if you qualify and you're up on the list. That's one lane. But the other thing, the other thing that I, and, and that is a very uh, uh, sort of staple definition of housing first and how it's applied. But the, the real answer to housing first, the sort of big picture answer to housing first is more affordable housing. And that's, and right now, and that's sort of the big policy shift that is about political will to fund the housing, affordable housing that we need. Our community, we can be proud. We're out front relative to other communities. And we're and still, we don't have nearly enough affordable housing, just like every community doesn't have enough affordable housing. We're just, so we get to sort of wear the badge that we, you know, are over and above the 10% mark that is a, that's a state, uh, a state benchmark. And we have done a great job in recent years and still, right? Where the deficit is so huge. And I mean, we can just know there's got, about to be a study release. This is a heads up, stay tuned. You'll be reading about in the newspaper. Um, the Greater Springfield Housing Study, which includes Hampshire County and Hamden and Franklin are releasing a study. Um, Wayfinders is, is, is a lead sponsor. UMass Donahue Institute is doing the research. And it's gonna tell us what we instinctively know, but it will, but I'll, and I'll just say now, cause the data is already out broadly speaking, it's not even in this region, but we know that there is, there is only one in four extremely low income people get affordable housing across across the country. I mean, there's a 75% gap in affordable housing units. So the real answer, Robert, is that the real answer to, to housing first is more affordable housing. 
And then, and then there's other sub, sub uh, lanes of that. And that I know if Jay's on the agenda, he'll talk more about the kind of work that he does that really works with chronically homeless people and people who are unsheltered altogether. And the idea of Housing First is not a shelter response. That is, it is, that is avowedly and um, vigorously not that. And that's where the gap is so massive and we have a lot of work to do. And luckily we have the, you know, we have, we're building a movement to do it. So come join us. And I just add to that in the 10 years that I've been here, I've not met one person that's gone from homelessness living outside to an apartment without some intermediate step in a shelter or other, other places. So, um, and then even if you're lucky enough to get, you know, a, a section eight voucher, it, are there any available in this town? Can, and there's someone with more knowledge about this can say, but there's also the rent needs to be below a certain level to qualify to live in that apartment. So there's a, there's often a gap there. So people may get that precious voucher of getting a home and not be able to be in Northampton and not want to use it because they don't want to go far away from where their support systems are. So if for what it's worth, other people can speak in more detail about that, but. Hey, um, I'm going to recognize Heather, Craig, and then, um, and then I want to get on to the other speakers. Okay, so I just have the answer to what Pastor Steph was talking about. There is a cap on the amount of rent that a Section 8 will pay in any given city. And the cap for Northampton on a two-bedroom apartment, which is what I have, is $1,100, including utilities. So think about that for a minute. That's that's just an example of what the cap looks like. And if you think that makes sense, I don't think it makes sense. That's not a reasonable cap for our housing market. So that was all I had. Thank you, Heather. And um, so at this point, I'd like to, uh, first of all, just a reminder to people, if your microphones are on and you're just hanging out at the house and you know chowing on something, mute yourself. Uh, for, so the speakers can have the floor. And um, so I, I wanna thank um, uh, Pamela and Steph. Thank you, the, this is great. Obviously there's more conversation we're gonna have to have here. And you feel free to stick around for the rest of the conversation. I believe Pamela's gotta run, but um, that um, thank you for your time. And I'd like to next um, uh, have up uh, Jay Levy. Um, yeah, wave goodbye. I just want to do as part of the, let me just say as part of my goodbye, I just want to say, um, and, and your introduction to Jay, Jay is such a central human being and a leader in this work in this region and in our community in Northampton. So, and I only sit around 7,000 screens with him, but I just want to say, great to see you here, Jay. And thank you for Hi, everything. Thank That's you. Great. On that note, good night all. Thank you, Pamela. And and I don't need to introduce Jay at all. Jay, you now have the floor. You've been introduced by former Councillor Schwartz. <laughs> yep. Okay. Um, thank you for having me tonight. Um, oh, I, I, you know what? We have too many Jays. I'd like to, I think, was Pamela referring to Jay Levy or Jay Sashetti? She left. I we don't know. So. <laughs> yeah. This is a funny problem. I never thought it. Well, had Jim, you had introduced me. Yeah, uh, I so prior. And then we'll go to Jay Sachetti. Sachetti. Yeah. Sachetti. Thank you. Um, Jay, Jay Levy. Thank you. So um, I do work a lot with Jay Sachetti as well from ServiceNet. So we're often on these groups, and that gets confused yeah. all the time. And I have to say, Jay has been a central figure <laughs> in the homelessness around the, the area for years. Right, right. <laughs> um, so anyways, uh, I work with the PATH team, Projects Assisting Transitions uh, from Homelessness. We do a lot of uh, outreach, literally in the woods, on the streets, in the parks. We also work jointly with folks who are in shelters, and with shelter providers like Jay Sacchetti and his group through uh, ServiceNet. Um, we uh, work very closely with uh, what Pamela was talking about, the coordinated entry 
system, doing the uh, vulnerability assessments, getting people on the by name lists, advocating to do the match to housing and connecting people to housing first uh, programs. It's very limited, but there are some that we do connect people um, into, and I'll give some quick examples of that. But before I start with that, let me just say I have two workers. So overall, I have 11 workers in my program, 11 FTEs, um, two workers that um, provide the bulk of service around uh, the Northampton area, and that's Brendan Plant and Charlene Arnell. And they're both uh, extremely dedicated uh, individuals who have been doing this work for many, many years. So I myself have been doing this since the 1980s, you know, which is hard for me to believe, uh, but it goes back that long. And they similarly have done this for decades now, uh, both Charlene and Brendan, in terms of being in the field and being dedicated to homelessness and, and reaching out to people and forming those person-centered relationships and then connecting people to the resources and the services that they need. We get um, funds through the Department of Mental Health and through SAMHSA. So we're both federally funded and uh, state funded. And so our target is folks uh, who are primarily uh, have uh, mental health issues, but that also means we work with people who are duly diagnosed and virtually anyone who's unsheltered, we end up working with because there's such high levels of trauma with that population that there's virtually always a mental health um, component. So we're pretty broad in who we see. We're not restrictive in terms of like DMH eligibility, that kind of thing. But we are very good because we're also clinical at getting people uh, eligible for Department of Mental Health Services and some of the housing that might follow there. And some of that housing is actually connected in with coordinated entry and that by name list and the housing match that's done, that's called Shelter Plus Care Services. Uh, that ServiceNet through the ACCS program runs. And we've like recently in the last maybe four months, I can think of three individuals that we've gotten DMH eligibility and actually placed into that program, actually placed them a, a while ago, but all three of them got housed quite recently through that program. And that's bringing a subsidy with a voucher connecting it to housing, and then it's coming with an ongoing support service. So that's a really good kind of placement that uh, helps people to stay placed and not end up through the revolving door of uh, becoming homeless again. We've also connected people to permanent supportive housing out in uh, Greenfield and in Millers Falls, but people from the Northampton area that we've placed out uh, that way. Community Human Development runs those permanent supportive housing uh, services. And so those folks are, in other words, they're getting a support service, just like I said, the other folks were through ACCS and ServiceNet. In this case, it's Community Human Development that provides a support service in Greenfield and out in Millers Falls at these particular projects where people were placed. So that's money that came in down through HUD to help support that service through the COC. Again, people on the by name list matched to that housing, but it all started with the outreach that Charlene and Brendan were doing to connect with these folks, do the assessments, get them on the list, help stabilize folks enough to follow through with appointments and all this stuff and get the people uh, placed. In addition, you know, with COVID-19, there's been a lot of issues uh, with people having no place to go, being on the streets, um, the shelters either being full or folks, although, you know, there has been some space lately in the shelters, so that's been a good thing, but not everyone will go to shelters as you heard from staff, right? There's a number of folks who have uh, high levels of trauma, a lot of triggers, the shelters are very crowded, they're easily triggered into kind of a fight flight response and it's very hard for them to stay within a shelter setting or even to consider to go there. So a number of those folks we've actually over the past two months, three months, have connected into motel settings. I can think of directly from the streets of Northampton, five people now, 
that we've connected to a motel in Holyoke where they're getting ongoing service and CHD runs the motel in Holyoke. Um, in addition, we have some transitional motel monies through PATH, my program, and we got two people currently placed in motels that way. So we're out and about doing a lot of work, meeting people, connecting with folks, placing people when we can into these settings and working with people long-term, again, whether it's on the streets, some of them in shelter settings uh, as well. And, um, and you know, we work as a, as a team with all of the other providers to make things happen. That's why I mentioned ServiceNet, I mentioned CHD. Uh, we work with staff. Um, we work with uh, the folks uh, around, um, you know, Northampton, like Alan Wolf, I know, and he's helped send some referrals and talk to us about people in need. Uh, PATH is more of an outreach service. So when we place someone into housing, what we provide is the transitional service around that placement to help that placement to be successful. And for at least two to three months, we remain very active in the case. With some folks who are not able to find further support services, we might lengthen that time up to six months. On rare occasions, it's been up to a year when we have someone who's current, who just remains unstable, unstably housed that is, and unstable and therefore they're at risk of eviction any given day. So then we continue uh, to work with them. But when we can pass people on to other community-based services or permanent supportive housing services, then we're not working as long after we do the placement. Uh, the other thing I will add is recently we've increased our services to do something called CSPECT, which is a housing stabilization service that I've added 1.5 FTEs to my staff. So that's a half-time person and a full-time person uh, that, that's come on board. And we're now doing housing stabilization services that are long-term for chronically homeless folks uh, that we can bill Medicaid for. So that's another way of getting some dollars into our service so we can hire more people and through that be there for folks after the housing placement. Now we wouldn't do that for someone that we placed into permanent supportive housing that comes with a support service, but we do do that for folks like we might, we might place someone through Valley CDC or we might place someone, let's say at, uh, through Wayfinders, let's say at uh, Lorraine's or uh, some of these other placements. So when someone gets into a placement and they need ongoing support service, if they're Medicaid eligible and we can bill for the CSPEC service, which is a community support program for people experiencing chronic homelessness, we can bill for that service and just see them uh, ongoing that way. Um, so that's in a nutshell, kind of, you know, what we do and how things work on, on my end. So Jay, I, I have a question uh, that's pertinent to, um, you know, my neighborhood, we, we've talked before uh, years ago, uh, yeah. on, through our work on Cut, at Cutchins. Uh, so, you know, right now, uh, my neighborhood has some neighbors who are, um, you know, uh, living in tents nearby and, mm -hmm. um, and we're being respectful. They're they're over there. There are neighbors and such. But how do you recommend that we as neighbors, you know, relate to these people and also uh, to respectfully make you know ensure that they're getting the services that they need? Well, I think it's uh, you know if, if you're looking at it as this is someone who lives in your community, you know, you recognize them and learn their names and you say hello to them and you greet them and and you just let them know about the resources that are available in the community and that and and you know that includes uh, our service in terms of outreach so we could also just let us know about these folks and where they are and we'll go over on our own and introduce ourselves and, and get to know them and just see how that goes um but also you know through service net there's a you know jay sacchetti will talk about the resource center, I don't know. And I think the hours have changed recently due to um, some of the work they're doing, um, you know, with first churches and, um, you know, expanding the shelter and all of that. But, um, but I do know that that resource center 
has been available for people uh, through the years. And I think twice a week is still available. So I'm sure Jay will, will talk about that. Um, but it's really uh, sharing resources with people and, and just getting to know them as human beings, as, as neighbors, as you say, right. and uh, being supportive in that way, recognizing them as opposed to just walking by and ignoring or, or uh, you know, not being inclusive. Right. I'll reach you after the meeting to make sure these folks are on your, your radar. Sure. Thank you for, for that information. Uh, counselors, any questions? Counselor Jarrett. And then Councillor um, uh, Foster. Great, Jay. Um, well, first, could you define the by name list? You referred to that. Yes. Yeah, so um, Pamela was talking about how there's uh, a continuum of care that gets dollars from HUD, and those dollars uh, fund different uh, housing options uh, that are affordable in the area and also to some degree, some support service that can be connected to some of those uh, houses. And so what we do is uh, we wanna construct a by name list, which means it's a list of all of the people who are uh, homeless in a given area and we're ranking them on the list in regard to vulnerability. So there's a vulnerability assessment that we do. And then based on the people who are most vulnerable, who are most at risk of, uh, of being in the hospital, of, of literally dying, of, um, of uh, also being chronically homeless at the same time. So they've been homeless like for the longest amount of time. Those folks end up being at the top of the list. And so we try to house them. So we have such a limited housing resource at our fingertips. We try to house those people first. So part of housing first was actually to say, let's get the housing to the most vulnerable the quickest. Um, and uh, so that's what the by name list really is about. It's matching, it's taking that list and then looking at the resources and services, including housing, most mostly housing, but other things as well that could be matched to the folks on that list. Great, thank you for that. Um, and then how many of the people that you're serving are you actually able to connect to housing placement? I'm just trying to get a sense of the extent of how many are unserved? Is it similar to that what um, Pamela Schwartz talked about, like 25%, 75%? Uh... The vast majority of the people on the list will not get matched to housing um, that's connected to these HUD dollars that we we're talking about through the continuum of care, like the specialized permanent supportive housing. But then we're still working with them to find other ways to connect them into some of the services they need. So for example, I started off by saying, you know, we had, we had placed this many people into motels recently. So those are people we continue to work with, but now through these motel settings to try to get them eventually uh, to housing. There's a number of folks that we try to help over time to connect them into shelters if we can. It's really a small percentage that we're able to go uh, you know, as Steph was mentioning, like directly from streets to housing. Often we're getting people on the list and it takes a while for their names to come to the top and for the housing to become available. And so they may end up in shelter and other places uh, in the meantime. So it's very hard for me to give a percentage because it's very, very fluid. But, um, and we're always looking at just different ways to get somebody in some way. Um, but in terms of how many people on that list is connected to like HUD resources? I can tell you it's a very tiny percentage overall on that list. We're probably looking at, uh, I would think less than 10% of the people on that list are getting you know, connected to permanent supportive mm -hmm. housing type um, resources. The list tends to be very big because it includes you know, all the people that are accessing shelter, all the people we're meeting on the streets that are, uh, that have been long-term homeless or vulnerable, you know, they're ending up on that list. And, and, and it's a pretty large list. It's not a small list. So um, I don't know, I don't know if Jay would have the numbers, but I think I, I would imagine there's a there's a, at least 150 people, something like that, on the list. Yeah. 
Yeah, across a three county region that would probably that's probably pretty close to that. Um, yeah. And the, just, you know, the other thing about the funding of that HUD housing and, um, you know, the mention of the uh, fair market rents, yet they are restrictive and, you know, government policy makes it hard to increase the number of housing opportunities for people because they're the regulatory process is burdensome. It's, you know, makes it difficult that, you know, you get money at the end of the year sitting there that you don't use because you, you haven't, they won't pay for this or they won't pay. But the whole idea that, you know, that they restrict how much you can spend on an apartment is very, very difficult to meet that. Um, and you just, and the, and the programs are very hard to run. They, it's become a supplemental program versus something that fully funds what you're doing. So you need other sources of in, of resources and income from other types of programs. And in these three counties, the rural nature of the counties, you don't have a large pot of dollars from some other reason like home and healthy for good or you know other avenues that exist in the larger urban areas. You know, a lot of the homeless dollars are entrenched in the eastern end of the state. And it's not their fault, but that's where the problem was biggest, where it began, you know, in earnest. So the dollars were poured in down there. And as it moves out here to this three county continuum, the dollars just shrink and shrink. So we're always, always working, you know, very hard to find money and other resources to help house people. But, you know, there's a lot of money that goes to waste because of government policy. We're doing a nice little segue here from one J to the other J. <laughs> yeah. And um, I, I also want to get Councillor Foster's question in. And then I think we'll, we can turn the focus to uh, Jay Sacchetti. I said it right that time? Sacchetti. Sacchetti. Oh. C-H in Italian is always a K. <laughs> Thank you, Sacchetti. And uh, that, um, Councillor Foster. Thanks, Councillor Nash. Um, Jay, I, just as you're talking about the outreach that, that you're doing with Elliot, I'm just curious sort of how that goes, you know, if, if a concerned neighbor um, contacts, contacts Elliot, um, you know, as outreach workers approach folks, and I know that there's a lot of relationship building, but sort of, can you, do you, do you um, have an estimate or, or can you talk a little bit about sort of the timeline from contacting folks and getting to know them to when you're at a point where you can start to connect folks with services? Oh, it really varies. You know, we think of it more like in stages of engagement and we go from uh, what I call you know, pre-engagement where we're just trying to get an initial communication with someone that's welcomed to uh, engagement where the engagement phase is you have kind of an ongoing uh, communication that's welcomed and there's boundaries that are being set between the worker and client and they understand the role of the worker and the types of things we can offer. And we start to understand the wants and the needs and the world of the client. So that's during the engagement phase. And then there's the contracting phase, which is the third phase in the process, where we're connecting to people's goals and we come to some agreement on what we're going to work on together. That's, that's the contract. So with some people, that can happen in one meeting, all of those phases, and other people, it can take several months. So it, it, there's really no way to, to tell you. I mean, it all depends on sort of the person. Uh, and how well when they see someone else approaching and the person that's approaching them, the kind of the vibe it gives off and, and what it triggers in the person. And, and uh, you know, there's really no way to predict on any given occasion, you know, how long. So the range is anywhere from immediate to immediate meaning in the same meeting, we get to the point of contracting and offering some services. Uh, and some resources perhaps that the person can begin to, to utilize mm -hmm. that they didn't know about uh, to it being, you know, several months or, or even never happening, you know, like the person just doesn't engage further. So that, that's the range. 
Thank you. And um, let's see, I see Robert Eastman's hand still raised. Um, and I also see Councillor Thorpe has a question. Councillor Thorpe. Thank you, Councillor Nash and, and Jay, thank you for being here. I have a question. So um, in regards to the services and regards to uh, the contract in between the transition and trying to find uh, an individual there, a, a home, a permanent placement, are you working with them um, in order to obtain also health insurance? Because health insurance is also a big uh, component and uh, in obtaining services. So are you working with the clients to obtain uh, health insurance? Yes, I mean, we, we work on uh, really anything that would be helpful uh, to move things along for that person. So it's whatever they're in agreement that they allow us to work on with them. Sometimes it's starting with basic ID that they need to get because many people have lost their ID or no longer have ID and that can be very hard uh, to replace and that can take some time. Uh, health insurance is something we're always looking at uh, as well as working on pathways to connect people to um, health services, health in a broad, broad way and a broad kind of way of, of thinking about it. So in other words, it can be physical health, it can be mental health, um, mm -hmm. but um, we're looking to uh, get people, you know, primary doctors, we're looking to get people, if they're interested, therapists, if they wanna get a, you know, medication eval, we look at that. We also partner with healthcare for the homeless, um, which provides some free medical service to folks while they wait to get um, uh, health insurance. So. There's some avenues that we're able to, you know, if someone has a health need, uh, we're able to address it right away, whether it's through health care for the homeless, whether it's through an emergency room, um, we're able to do that with somebody. Um, but the key to our service really is that everything we do is voluntary and based on choice uh, of working, you know, with the person. There might be a rare circumstance where if someone is truly a danger to themselves or others, um, that we look at some involuntary options um, to make sure the person's safe or, or other people are safe. But that's, that's very rare that, that we go down that road with someone. And when we do, we, we continue to follow up, we continue to, to engage and re-engage and, and we don't give up because we think they might be mad at us because we had to go down that road. We, we continue to to provide the service and offer it. And, and usually that works out pretty well, actually. Thank you for that information. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I have a question to the, I, I'm looking for uh, Dana, who was supposed to be joining us from um, Community Action. I'm not seeing Hi, her. Jim. Hi, Jim. Oh, there I, you yes, you have it blocked. I couldn't rename the uh, the okay. thing here, so I'm sorry about that. All right, good. So <laughs> I, I, I have my eye on you and we will be going to, I, I just wanted to make sure how I was managing people's times here. Okay. And um, that, um, are there any other questions for from counselors? Councilor Nash, I thought I saw Jose Adastra's hand up and I don't. Yeah, I thought I saw it briefly as well. And But I do see Councilor Labarge and I will keep an eye out for Jose's hand again. Okay. Go ahead, counselor. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> Jay, I wanna thank you for your presentation. Um, I do have some concerns, Jay. I'll just do it very, very quickly. I would say as a counselor, I've been working on a, situ a situation here in Ward 6 that is not a healthy situation. And I would say about seven and a half years or so. And it's a um, older man and he does own some property, not buildable or anything, and just loves living in his truck, in his truck. And he's not a healthy individual. And the city did step in about three and a half years, four years ago um, where our building inspector helped get him a place to live in Florence. And that did not last long. There was a problem and I cannot answer to that. But anyways, 
He's to the form now of his family called me asking for help again. This was like in December, concerned about him living in a truck. And I, I'm very concerned about it. And many of my residents are also. I've even talked with him. I think Laura's gotten calls from him, our council clerk before. And it, it's, you try to help him. And then it was like, yes, counselor, I want help, Marianne. I try to get him the help. And if a social worker goes up there, He'll say, no, I don't need it. But he's into the, the apart medically right now where the family told me he has seizures and I'm very concerned about this. Like every day I drive up there because I don't go on the property because it's private property that he owns and I'll yell out his name. Sometimes he'll come out and say, oh, my counselor. But I don't know. I saw him about two weeks ago on his bicycle all kinds of stuff on it, having a hard time motivating. How do I get help for him? It's, it's, it's impossible here. I have so many people worried about him, even attorneys that live further up from him are concerned, even a doctor. We try to help him and nothing happens. Hmm. Yeah, it's very difficult because you're, you're talking about someone who is you know, on their own land and um, and then you know they're living in a vehicle, and um, the way the uh, the way people look at uh, people's rights being kind of at the forefront when it comes, right. even if you have mental health issues or whatever else might be going on, or major addiction issues, you know, if you're not really deemed a danger to self or others, then then we have to uphold choice. So then it's really a matter of who he might engage with. So uh, now sometimes you can uh, bridge relationships, right? So if it's, if he has a, a good connection with a family member, and if that family member maybe would want to be more active with introducing a worker where maybe there's a three-way meeting, uh, that can sometimes help to bridge the engagement and start the trust a little bit. But if it's a matter of just you know, the city hears about it, uh, someone from outreach is called to try, the outreach worker goes out, he says, no, I'm okay, I don't, I don't want you to be here right now. You know, he has that right to say that, and because he's on private property, which is his, mm -hmm. uh, that's going to be respected by the worker. So that's sort of the dilemma that we're in. And then sometimes uh, you might find uh, depending on what the people that know him best, we're, what we're always after and trying to figure out is what does the person value? What do they find important? What, what, what would they find basically engaging to talk about or helpful to offer? So for instance, if, if it turned out, I'm not saying he falls into this category at all, but if it turned out that he was someone that was, let's say, affiliated in a religious way and that was valuable to him and important, mm -hmm. uh, then maybe con trying to connect him to like what Steph does would be a really good thing. It would be a nice first step and it would introduce some community and it would kind of get him maybe off the land. So you're always looking for, is there a way to do a meaningful connection somewhere? It doesn't have to start with like, there's something wrong with you. So we're connecting you mm -hmm. to someone who's gonna assess what's wrong and fix your impairment. See, a lot of people turn off to that. But if it's really about, you know, someone is interested in connecting you with um, further community, solidarity, uh, something meaningful that makes sense in regard to what he values. Sometimes that's a better place to start with some of these cases that are a little harder uh, to engage. And then, like I said, maybe doing introductions where it's not just, here's a number go, but you're bridging the relationship. So I would consider thinking a little out of the box, you know, in terms of ways to engage him somewhere. Uh, and then from there, you know, sometimes through doing, that's why a lot of what's exciting about housing first is we're not starting often with the treatment and the impairment. We're, we're starting off with saying, we wanna help you to get settled and housed. And as the person takes on those challenges, whatever it is, cause you know, when you move into housing you're automatically faced with what four basic things. One is just to stay safe. Two is to be a good neighbor or to at least get along 
some, you know, interpersonally with others. Three is to take care of the property. And four is to pay rent. So we find that as we place people in housing, they often start to struggle with one of those four things. And as we work with them, and we already have the relationship and they're already thankful that we've helped them to get housed, suddenly they start to open up and say, well, maybe I could use some help around mental health addiction or something else, because it is actually impacting one of these four things I just listed. But it's kind of like a co-discovery of that, yeah, as sure. opposed to us starting with kind of a cold assessment and being treatment oriented in the very beginning. So my guess is with this guy, you know, he's probably proud on some level. I mean, I don't know him, but I'm just guessing. And, um, or, you know, we meet some people who are suspicious or just don't trust easily, have had a lot of trauma and they don't really know what a new person's gonna do. So the question is how do you do grad or gradually do the introduction? Thank you so much, Jay. I appreciate listening and trying to get some help for you from me, but, um, it's very sad, very, very sad. And I do have residents who care. And we're trying to find a shelter for him. Because look at Friday, they're saying how bad and cold it's gonna be Friday. Every day I go up there. And if I yell and say, you know, so-and-so, Counselor LaBarge, he'll come running out, Mary Ann, right? But I've noticed a significant change in him, riding his bicycle, struggling, I mean struggling. And with the family talking with me in December, and I'll repeat it again, that he now has seizures, I worry about him being in this truck, no heat, he lost his license about a year ago. So I don't know. It's very hard to see this happening. Hmm. We Thank witness you. a lot of things out there. I mean, it, it is very hard. I mean, I share that. With you. But I would say too, it you know, to not undervalue the connection that you and your neighbors are making, and it is a long road, but you know that is sometimes more valuable. Just to add I mean, let him let him know about. I mean, I'm sure he does already, but you know, you certainly can let him know, and you'll hear from Jay Sacchetti where their local shelter option is right now, and it could be even like a safety plan. Like if things get so bad that you can't hack it in the truck for whatever reason, you know, it's just so bad, so cold, most anyone wouldn't be able to, here's another option. So it's not, you're not telling him he has to do this or he should do it. You're saying, here's another option just for you to have in your back pocket, just in case you need it, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, that's how we try to more gradually introduce things. Um, but the, it's knowing about the resource that, that might be there. Right, I know I told his family, his brother in December, <laughs> I told him to um, call um, Mr. Ware from First Churches, also ServiceNet. So mm -hmm. I don't know if the brother had done that or not because there's concerns about his health and his welfare. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I see uh, Jose Adastra's hand is raised. Uh, Jose, do you have a question for our speakers? Um. I think uh, I do have a question. I think uh, especially hearing Marianne Labarge's statement now, um, I think in, in, in combination with housing and all the effort and care that you're putting in with housing, I think it would be great um, if the people here would show solidarity with the demands of Northampton abolition now to make a department of community care with the almost million dollars that was reallocated by the, um, by the, not realloc, just taken away by the mayor because we haven't spent it, and everyone knows that money that's frozen is no good. I think we should immediately make a Department of Community Care. Marianne wouldn't have to be so worried. She would have someone to call, someone who knew what substance abuse was about, and 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 what what uh what it means and how to actually figure that out. Of course, Marianne should be concerned and it shouldn't be her responsibility either, you know, and it shouldn't be her neighbor's responsibility. Um, and she should have someone to call and it shouldn't be, you should slowly get him to find alternative shelter. There should be someone who can go there who is part of the town's infrastructure. 
um, like a peer worker or um, someone like from what was previously the RLC and is now the Wildflower Alliance um, for uh, peer support groups. Um, so I feel like, you know, I, I, I got here late, um, but I'm really coming to say that housing is not complete without care. Um, and you can you can house someone over and over again, and they're not going to stay in that house unless you take care of the stuff that that traumatized them out of being unable to get a house in the first place in this uh, economy and environment. So I, you know, I'm not coming here judging anyone. I just feel like everyone that's here that cares about housing, just like Marianne, you know, that cares about your neighbors like that, maybe we'll lose our stuff in the middle of some sort of worldwide plague and start sleeping in our trunk, right? But that shouldn't be our neighbor's burden, right? Right? We should have a crew in town that is paid to do that and we have the money for that. And it shouldn't be the cops because they don't know what they're doing, right? So, you know, I just wanna, you know, I just heard Marianne say this beautiful, caring testimony about their neighbor um, and they deserve that kind of support. Um, and, you know, he could die in the cold. He could have COVID, you know, from the sounds of it. Um, and, uh, you know, what do we have? We have money invested in the cops, right? We have money that got reallocated to make up for parking revenue. Yeah. And we have money that got reallocated to deal with, to make a pretty bike path, right? But we don't have any money to help Marianne's neighbor, right? Um, or any of the other countless fellows on the street. And, but, but it's there, it's just not accessible. So I feel like, uh, yeah, I just came here to kind of make a plea that people uh, beg that we, re we rethink the way that we use our money in town. And, you know, some of the people on the street have been on the street since I was eight years old. I'm from Holyoke. I've seen some of the same faces here on the street in Northampton and on the bike path since I was a child. So, you know, whatever's been happening here hasn't been good enough. Um, and maybe it's part of care. Maybe it's the care part, community care. And that's that's all I came to say. Thank you, Jose. And um, so I'd like to uh, get to our second Jay, who's been patiently waiting. And we have Dana, who's also waiting as well. Um, Jay. Um, yep. You're, I'm, you are I'm going to talk really quickly because I'm losing battery power. I left my power cord in the office. Go. Getting really low. So, um, but let me just give you an, an overview of um, how we got to first churches. Uh, and it was by, a, you know, a, a, a tremendous effort by, you know, the first churches stepping forward, but also, you know, the city of Northampton, Allen's here um, and the efforts they did and, you know, bringing, that particular site, you know, into fruition. So, you know, we opened in the beginning of December and like anything new, you know, you go through lots of, get the bugs out. And uh, tonight there's a, there should, there's probably 25 or 27 people in there, depending on who was, came in and intakes today. Uh, we also have the Grove Street shelter that's open. That's, that is full that has 15 people there. So um, you know, our target number for beds is, is 45. So we're getting close to that for the overall um, you know, bed count. The, we expect that probably with the cold weather that we will be full over the next few nights. The, um, and you know, we've worked very closely with Meredith O'Leary from the Department of Health, you know, the Director of the Department of Health in Northampton. And she's in that department has been absolutely wonderful and crucial to us keeping people healthy and keeping the shelter relatively COVID free. We've only had one positive case there uh, since the beginning of December. Uh, most of our shelters have been that way. I'm, I don't know why, but they just are. But, you know, we take all the precautions. Um, people are assessed as they come through the door every day. There is um, an isolation hotel in Pittsfield that people can go to if they are COVID positive. Uh, the transportation is provided by the local sheriff's departments. So we have a way to get people out of a shelter into a safe place. 
and keep the shelter in, in good shape. And so we have, you know, MANA provides food. Um, our Friends of the Homeless, our other partner uh, volunteer group, you know, they, Hampshire County, they provide breakfast. Uh, MANA's doing lunch and dinner. So people are, you know, we have plenty of food that's brought in for people. So that's, that has worked well. Um, we are, you know, we're running double, triple the number of staff we need having two sites. So that's been a bit of a difficulty. You know, we live on the edge of, of having enough staff, um, you know, on a, every day. It's always a struggle. And I think it's a struggle for most human service agencies and shelters across the state. Um, it's a tough time to find employees, but we're getting through that. Uh, we're keeping the, the site staffed. Uh, and, you know, we work with, you know, Elliot and Jay, and we work with the, you know, the, the whole system of care that's available. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Bossy who um, provides a standing order for testing with Cooley Dickinson Hospital. The uh, Meredith runs the testing and the vaccine down at the senior center. Uh, our staff and all the guests in the shelter have been offered a vaccine. And it's, you know, a surprising number of um, guests at the shelter have turned it down, you know, for various reasons that we all hear. So that to us is a bit concerning. We wish more people would get vaccinated, but um, they are refusing. So it's probably only been about half the, the number of people that have accepted it. Um, and most of our staff have been vaccinated up to this point. So uh, we feel we're in a pretty good place where, where that is at. Our resource center, uh, which Jay mentioned early, is open two days a week, uh, primarily for the healthcare for the homeless. And Dr. Bossy, who um, provides that medical care on Tuesdays and Thursdays there. The other three days it's closed with the exception of um, people shower and do their laundry there. There's no shower or laundry facility at the first churches. Thankfully, they're just half a block away. So um, that has worked out pretty well. So I think, you know, overall the effort um, within the community and from, you know, the, the mayor's office has been, you know, really helpful in getting everything up there and running smoothly and, you know, providing those extra beds it was no easy task. And so I, you know, I'm sure people have questions and that's the overview and I'm sure I'm happy to answer anything that anybody might have. Well, Jay, I, I have one quick, uh, my question is how can people help out? How can uh, neighbors in Northampton help your efforts here? Well, we, you know, we've had, you know, United Way has, you know, th there's been some donations that come in around, you know, clothing and socks and jackets and hats and that has all been helpful. We have some volunteers that are there. Uh, Lauren Davis, who um, has, you know, organizes the volunteers and those volunteers help out around mealtimes uh, so that, you know, in the morning and at noon and at you know, the, the evening meal, and that takes a lot of the pressure off the staff. It allows, allows them to kind of keep an eye on people in terms of, you know, looking for symptoms of, you know, COVID and, you know, just really working in, in keeping the facility clean. Uh, we have a deep clean twice a week. Um, and, you know, we have, the company comes in and we have foggers on site in case we need those. Um, we have a protocol within the agency that if there's a positive case, we immediately bring another cleaning company in um, that provides cleaning. Um, we did have that one quarantine there earlier in December. We had one individual that was COVID positive and went to the hotel in Pittsfield. We tested everybody. There's an ongoing testing going, that, going there. Um, once a week, people can get tested. Um, at the, either at Cooley Dick or down at the senior center. Uh, so we, you know, we have, so, and so in terms of helping, I mean, people have signed up through United Way. And so we've had plenty of, you know, assistance that when we, we've needed it. 
And that would be the best thing is to be contact United Way to get on the list. Thank you. I see uh, Councillor Mayori. Hi, Jay. Thank you so much for your good work. I'm, I'm glad it's going uh, relatively well and I'm, I'm glad it's downtown and, and that's excellent. I just, I'm trying to visualize it a little more. Are there, um, process a little more. Are there sobriety requirements? And is there a kind of a police presence or any kind of regulatory? Um, no, um, no. I'm trying, but I can't. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Sharing. There's, there's no sobriety requirements. Um, there's just a behavioral requirement. You know, it's, you know, when you have a lot of people in, in, in one space, it's like, you know, you just got to behave. And, um, you know, and, and as long as, and really the, the only thing that we'd ask people to leave for is violence. Um, and that's something that's pretty standard across all our shelters, you know, that if you're going to be violent towards others, that's, you, you can't be there. But um, the police department's always been very supportive and helpful. And if there's an issue, they, let our staff take the lead and they're just there to support. So that's, it's been a good relationship. Uh, yeah, just, uh, and what time, is there any time during the day? It's not, it's not a warming center at all, folks. It's yeah. open 24 seven. Oh, it is. Okay. Yes. Yep. So it's kind of de facto a warming center or not, it's not being used that way. No, now. it's, it's, you know, we can't, it's, it's open for the resident, the people right. that are staying there, there in Grove Street, they're both open 24 seven. Okay, thanks so much, Jay. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Jarrett. Yeah, thanks, Jay, for coming. Um, I was wondering how many people end up being turned away? We haven't turned anybody away. Um, you know, you know, if you, if you've shown up at the front door, then you get in. We have we have not been full to capacity, and I think that's because there's a, you know, Holyoke and Springfield have increased the number of their beds, and both those communities have put a lot of pressure on our winter shelter here in Northampton. So um, I think we're feeling that not only in Northampton but also in Greenfield and Pittsfield because we've always had a population from from the Hampton County that have been in those shelters also. Um, and so they've really increased the number of their beds, and that that's been that's that's been a really good thing for you know the shelters that we run. We have we can take care of the community need of people that want to be in the shelter. Yeah, if I could just mention um, the piggyback on what Jay just said, there's there's about 140 motel rooms being used in Hamden County, um, so that's really a big part of this. Yeah. Great. So I want to be conscious of the time here, and we have one more speaker. Um, and but I do want to get Councillor Labarge's question in. Thank you, Councillor. Hi, Jay. Haven't seen you in a while. Hi, hey, good. Uh, I don't question. I have seen um, several homeless people who have dogs. So do they bring their dogs into the shelter also? That's, it's always, you know, a case by case basis, you know, um, we cannot, we have to, you know, we, we have to let a service dog in. Um, they've recently been, you know, that's part of our contract with the Department of Housing and Community Development. Um, the, and they were on this comfort animal um, policy for a long time, which they've recently changed. Uh, but We've also worked with people if they have a dog to get the dog fostered, you know, while they're there or, you know, um, but, you know, at a place like First Churches, it's almost impossible to have a dog in there. We have had dogs at Grove Street yeah. and parrots and cats. <laughs> um, yeah, so, um, yeah, so that's always I'm kind of a really needed. case by case. Okay. Um, Lots of times people have somebody else take care of their dog too. That's true. At Grove Street Inn on your safety minimums, they're there 24 seven, mm -hmm. correct? Yep. 
And you're talking about, I can't remember how many is, how much is the capacity? Is it 45 at that house? No, it's 15. 15 and more. Our winter capacity has always been 45 beds, right. you know, every year, year after year. And we're at that this year. We've been able to replace that. Okay. All right. So how many night staff are there? Say like the third shift? At, at Grove are they Street? Volunteers? Yeah. Are they volunteers? At, at Grove Street, it's just one staff. There's 15 people there. Okay. We work on a ratio of one to 20. Okay. There's two overnight staff at the church. Okay. And there'll be, there's three. Most of the time, we try to have three staff on that second shift and two to three staff on the first shift because we, we want to work with people to, you know, do a housing plan, have them talk about where they go next. Jay, I want to thank you very much. I've worked with you for a long, long time, and it's not an easy job at all. No, and our staff do a great job. They, they've been out in front of this for, from the beginning. Um, for the most part, most of our staff have stuck around and have really stood at the front door and, and done a good job of welcoming people in. It is, and it's not, people don't realize who've not experienced working with different types of behaviors. And it's like, you do the best that you can mm -hmm. to, to yep. try to give them a good quality of life. And that's where it's all about. And I wanna thank you. I wanna thank ServiceNet for everything you do in our community. Thank you. Thank you, you're welcome. So um, I, I really wanna to get to Dana, but I, I see, uh, I see uh, Steph and Gina Louise, uh, Councillor Shara have questions. Councillor Shara. Steph had her hand raised first. Yeah, okay. Steph, Mine's just really brief. I um, just wanted to put out there, um, you asked Jay what the shelter needs. I would say for all of us, um, the top, there are lots of people donating all kinds of things, which is amazing, mm -hmm. but we are always in need. And so is in the shelter of thermals, gloves, underwear, coats and boots are always something that's needed right now. Also sleeping bags and things like that. But people have been responding generously. I just want to throw out a very specific way you can help any of us to, you know, help people. Thank you, Steph. Um, and it was very good that Steph went first because that was, I wanted to ask Jay and anyone else, um, you know, one, if you could say what needs were and if you could also just quickly talk, I think you mentioned before about volunteers, but if you need volunteers and how people can volunteer. Yeah, well, they can, it would call the United Way. They're keeping a list of volunteers and then they work with Lauren Davis around that and they manage that out of there. So if you contact the United Way, they will put you on a volunteer list. Thanks. Thank you, Jay. Uh, Councillor Jarrett, and also I know you got to run in, in about 10 minutes. Yeah, that's just what I was going to speak to. I'm going to have to go in about 10, but it uh, looks like there will still be quorum for our committee. So I'm sorry uh, to leave you all early. Good luck with your neighborhood meeting over there. Um, all right. So uh, Jay, thank you. Thank you to the Jays. Um, I, um, I want to now get to, to Dana, who uh, works for uh, Community Action. And Dana uh, works, uh, has expertise around helping people who are faced with eviction. Um, Dana, you have the floor. All right, thank you. And thank um, you for being so patient. Oh, it's, it's, it's a great been... meeting. I'm learning information too, so it's great. Um, so um, I first wanted just to make sure everybody knew uh, generally about Community Action or Pioneer Valley um, and that you probably recognize the agency for some of its major programs that it runs, uh, which is the Head Start program and also the Fuel Assistance program. Um, in the Hampshire County area, we serve um, families with uh, access to WIC, which is the Women's Infant Children Nutrition Program, some family support programs that include um, home visiting, and um, the Volunteer Tax Assistance Program. 
-hmm. And um, uh, my particular program is the Community Resources and Advocacy Program, which has two distinct elements to it. One part of it is a information referral phone line that um, anybody can call into to get some individualized assistance uh, with problems that they may be facing, um, a variety of different needs, such as um, if they uh, have a need for food or uh, struggling with um, a notice from their landlord. Um, so, you know, people call for all kinds of things, although the majority of, of people are focused on those types of issues. And, um, you know, somebody is um, available to answer the phone basically all the business days from nine to 12 and one to four. Um, so when they call, um, the person who answers the phone would it be addressing their issue that they call about, but also asking permission to screen them for other programs or needs that they might be eligible for. Um, so the, our particular programs um, will help people who have trouble applying themselves or want assistance um, with say a SNAP application um, or perhaps they're on SNAP and are having trouble uh, with some aspect of it. Um, so they may need a little advocacy around whatever's going on in their case, we can help with that. Um, we are certified application counselors for the health insurance programs. So we can give some advice and assistance with that as well. Um, and currently, as you can guess, the, the majority of the calls right now are around uh, housing and eviction needs. Um, so we, we typically are looking at helping people prior to, uh, hopefully prior to being evicted. Um, so upstream of a lot of the conversation that we've been talking about earlier. Um, and we, when we talk to people on the phone, um, we try to determine, first of all, where is there, where is the best place for them to get the help that they need? So it may be with our program or it may be with Wayfinders or there's some other uh, smaller things that go on in the area that could possibly help them as well. So Community Action has a variety of different funding sources mm -hmm. and depending upon who's calling and who we're talking with, um, you know, we try to figure out whether or not any of the funding sources that we have are going to be able to assist the person um, with their particular uh, problem or whether or not um, perhaps they really should be looking at going to Wayfinders for assistance. Um, so uh, the, one of the major things is that Wayfinders right now has access to up to $10,000 per household to help people who are struggling with that eviction. Um, and community action does not have that amount of money. So for many people, um, when, especially when they may be owing five, seven, eight, or beyond $10,000, um, that you know, this is really the best place for them to be applying. Um, so we can give some very detailed information about the process, about, um, filling out the um, moratorium the form that we that um, was talked about earlier about how to do that about uh, for some people who are not sure about what is the process of an eviction uh, some people are getting a notice from their landlord and they think i have to leave in two weeks and we're helping them understand that there's a legal process that the landlord must go through and and um uh, trying to, um, you know, calm people down through the conversation so that they're not as uh, anxious because, of course, anybody getting a letter like that or owing money to their landlord, that, you know, this is a crisis for them. This is a huge thing. And um, we want to try to help them navigate um, the process and get to the best place that's going to be able to help them. So I did want to give you a little bit of um, background around um, what the RAFT program is offering to people um, because, uh, you know, it's right now, this is like, this is the big thing. And as they said, there are, she said, half of the applications, I believe earlier that are sitting there incomplete. So Wayfinders has an online application process with lots of questions. 
And uh, certainly if you're struggling with language, it could be very difficult. Um, and that could be even if you don't speak English or if maybe perhaps, you know, you're not, um, you have difficulty reading English, that happens as well. Our, our agency is helping people to submit those applications if they need help with that. Um, the people who can apply to this are households that have 80% of the area median income. So that, what is that you wonder? That's a household of one with an annual gross income of 47,850 and a household of four, what uh, would be 68,300. So that's 80%, which is folks that have a, uh, a financial hardship related to COVID, okay? And they would be uh, what they're actually calling the IRMA program. So Wayfinders is doing both RAFT and IRMA. RAFT is a, a program that's been around for many years residential assistance, uh, basically for people in transition, I believe is the acronym name. <laughs> and the IRMA is for people who are basically between uh, 50 and 80% AMI. In both cases, they can help with uh, foreclo uh, foreclosure or mortgage payments for individuals, and they can also help with rent. Um, and like I said before, in both cases, uh, they have funds that can go up to I believe it's $10,000. So um, they have an application that's online, found at their website. Um, I'm trying to think of what else I could tell you about that. They they do have a phone line. I don't think I don't know that you would get through, <laughs> honestly, to be to be you know, fair about that. Uh, and uh, community legal aid um, is helping people who primarily are in court, are getting involved with the court process to apply for the RAFT program as well. Um, so we're trying to catch the people before they're getting into the, the court program process uh, actually to help them. And once they're involved in the court process, usually community legal aid is stepping in. Um, there was one question that came up earlier um, that talked about the court process. There are resources at the court to help people. Um, there are court service centers. There are a lot of mediators um, who are hired some by the court and some uh, through you know, different agencies or groups that provide that service to folks. Um, my personal experiences have having been to the court a couple of different times is that you know, people are afraid. People need to speak up, those people that are in court in the eviction process. I mean, it's a very daunting process. And they are, you know, sort of put on the spot to, to speak up and say, I want community legal aid. Um, if they don't speak up, they kind of get, you know, funneled into this process. Well, you go with a mediator, you go do here, you do this. So, um, it's partially on them to be verbal about it. And it's so hard to do, especially if you're dealing with a system that has, you know, a bunch of lawyers there. Mm -hmm. The lawyers frequently will approach a, a, a tenant and say, you know, let's talk on the side. Let's see if we can figure something out. And if I'm a tenant and my, my landlord is suggesting that I might talk and I can get out of this, maybe that's what I want to do. You know, so I think that it, it's even with best intentions, it's a very difficult environment. Um, I have not been involved in any of the um, current processes that are happening, which are, are all in Zoom, <laughs> but I can't imagine that it's any easier for people who are going to court. Um, so there's, you know, community legal aid, it's wonderful that they have been able to hire a lot more people um, to step up and hopefully meet some more of that demand because they are, they are representing, you know, the, as we said, the tenants that are showing up there. Um, and that is really super important because the process is so difficult. It's very stressful and difficult for, for people. Um, and um, I guess the other thing I do want to mention to everybody is that, you know, we very happily do have some funds that came through the city of Northampton as well. Um, 
to help people who are, um, again, struggling with, with a notice. We don't need a summons to court. We just need them to be late on their rent. And um, they do need to have um, a, some sort of reason connected to the virus being spreading in the community, um, that uh, they're having a financial burden, um, experiencing a problem because of that, which I think you know, a lot of people are experiencing that just because of increased costs. Uh, kids being home and, and uh, having to take care of them, et cetera. And um, those people can, you know, certainly we encourage everybody, if you know of anybody who is behind on their rent to please give us a call so that we can help them um, either access the funding that we have um, or if necessary to access the funding through Wayfinders. And uh, like I said, one of the biggest things is information, giving people the information that they need to try to um, navigate the system that we have right here. So um, I do, I like to tell everybody the phone number too, in case you, you in fact, um, really? yes, 413-582-4200. Um, so um, like I said, we're happy to hear, hear from people anytime they need to and um, try to help them out. I also wanted to mention that several times they brought up the COC during this conversation. Community action is actually, um, has been for about, oh, I think it's about a year and a half to almost two years, the home of the COC, the coordinated uh, entry program that people were mentioning. Um, is not part of my program or my department. Um, but they do have a website with a lot of interesting, you know, information about if you want to know more about that, you could go to three county COC. So it's the word three spelt out county COC dot community action dot US. Um, and it talks about, you know, what is the, uh, what is the program? What is the by names list? It has also a page with some data on it as well. Um, and I recently heard there was somewhere, I think it was about 170 people on the list, on the by names list right now, so. Thank you, Dana. And thank you for uh, mentioning um, community legal aid um, and because Jen Derringer could make it, but then couldn't make it. And so um, yeah. you, you covered for her very nicely there. I, I appreciate that. You're welcome. Not in as much detail as she would have, though, I must say. Well, you know, we might have to have her back. We'll probably have to have you back, too, as well. So, um, oh. counselors, any, any questions for Dana? Did I see somebody in the room raise their hand? I think I saw Ward 3 resident Sarah Williams raising her hand. Hi, Jim. Um, I am just curious how this information is getting out to the community. I assume based off of the impact that COVID has had, there might be an increased number of people who have never been late on a mortgage payment or rent before and have no idea that these sources or resources could be available to them. So if you're trying to catch them before they're going through the court process, how is this information getting out? Because I can also assume people are very ashamed of it, especially if they've never been in this process. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I'll, I'm not quite sure how Wayfinders is disseminating information about that. Um, I know that it has, you know, been in the news and whatnot, but that doesn't mean people pay attention to the news or, you know, maybe people purposely don't want to pay attention to the news. Um, but um, Community Action has um, been sharing information um, on our website as well as sending out some flyers. Um, and I think we need to do some more outreach about that actually. Um, so um, I'd like to see us be able to get it through the school system to people as well. Um, Jim, I believe um, Janice shared a flyer with you already about that that we had. Um, but if you have other suggestions for ways of contacting people, I'm happy to take it. 
Jim, can you pass that flyer over to me to put on our Ward 3 Facebook page and list there? I will do that. And there's, lot, there's other neighborhood or organizations we can connect with. And, um, and also, we'll make sure this information gets out to all of the city councilors with their email list. Oh, perfect. That would be great. Any other questions from counselors and members of the public? Okay. All right. You know, we're, we're almost, yeah, we're just a little bit over here. I'm feeling good about this. I, I just want to thank everybody who's, who showed up tonight. Um, and so Nash, this, oh, so I want to interrupt you. Uh, Dan Kennedy has his hand up. Oh, let's get, yeah, Dan. Hi everybody. Um, I'll keep this sort of short because I know um, some of the folks have already left, but for the folks who are still on, when it comes to the services, I think the, the recurring theme is that there's a lot going on. There's a lot of outreach that needs to happen, but there's also gaps in the service um, in, in different services, either structurally um, in terms of regulations around them, anything like that. Um, so I guess the question that I have is both it's probably too complex to answer shortly, but I'll try um, or I'll ask it anyway. Um, what are the things that you think you would need or your organizations would need to scale up services or fill in those gaps? And what is it that the city could provide? And what is it that we might need to lobby the state for um, in terms of support or um, in terms of changes, at least to have the biggest impact, especially the short term, right? Thinking about a winter during COVID. Um, I guess that's sort of open for anybody. Um, just, just thinking about what, what can we do to, to make things better quickly? Um, I guess it's my question. The biggest thing on my mind is, um, and thank you for the question, is what I spoke about earlier, that there needs to be a warming center of some kind um, and some organization to oversee that and, and to have the right people in that. I mean, you can certainly open that up to volunteers, but if they haven't worked with this population before, that can be you know, difficult without some training. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, I know Jay has left, but um, you know, any of the organizations, I think you know, it would be nice to be able to pay people more fair wages to do the work that they're doing. Um, it's a very stressful job working in shelters and other things. Uh, and and um, yeah, and I just, I don't know if that's possible or how any of that works. I'm just a church, but I would like to see people getting paid more fairly for the, for the difficult and, and, and courageous during COVID times, especially work that they're doing. Um, and, and maybe I think we need to look at, you know, going beyond just the agencies that we have now. Um, we ask a lot of, of a small amount of agencies in town, and I can't help but wonder if we're, we're putting too much on each agency to, to meet too many needs. And maybe there needs to be another shelter and a different organization besides ServiceNet. Not that ServiceNet isn't doing a great job, but it, it's a huge organization that has so many things that they're trying to accomplish. And um, maybe there needs to be another partner that also picks up some of that slack, or I'm always going to push for more you know, social workers. Um, and I am clearly picking my words, not case managers. I think there's a need for social workers, which have more training. Um, so those are some of my random thoughts. <laughs> um, I see Heather Craig has her hand raised. Yes, and I was thinking about um, one sort of really effective thing might be the equivalent of sort of, you know how you have your COVID ambassador out there talking about masks? It might make sense to have ambassadors um, who actually know how to get somebody to, somebody who's unfamiliar with the services that's in their first place, or maybe they have a language problem, uh, connected to people who can help them. Um, and I know that like in my housing community, we have two or three people that actually know who to call and that's who everybody else goes to. And that's informal and that's what you do in a community. But what if we had just at this time an ambassador that could tell you, this is, here's the numbers, this is who you call, you know, I'm willing to help you. Thank you, Heather. 
Um, I see Robert Eastman's hand raised. Robert. Um, yeah, uh, while everyone's here, I guess I was just curious on uh, people's thoughts of, um, you know, in addition to a warming center, we've heard from the housing community that uh, mutual aid grants would be really helpful. And I've been doing a lot of research into other towns who have successfully given grants to individuals unconditionally, and they've been able to get into housing faster than with services available, and it's actually saved the city money. So I'm just curious if that is an option that's being considered. I, I'm unfamiliar with what Robert's asking about. I have a feeling Steph might know or Dana might know. No. <laughs> I think what Robert is saying is, and correct me if I'm wrong, Robert, but it's just simply a fund that community members could give to you that would be direct access for people. Um, one of the biggest things um, in any studies show um, giving people direct funds for them to make choices in their lives is often a better way of doing it than, um, than tying a lot of strings and a lot of rules around things. But Robert, I, I put it back in your core to qualify, but that's what I've been thinking about as well. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure if it would be a community fund or not. Um, I know in Vancouver, the city itself actually made payments to individuals. Um, so I don't know what the, the model would look like applied to Northampton, but yeah, something along those lines. Most of the money that's out there available to people is never paid to the people. It's always paid to a landlord or a utility company or, or whoever. It doesn't, it doesn't go directly to a person in need, usually um, regulated in a way that it, it can't, essentially. I think Thank it's you. a great question, though, to bring up, Robert, especially as we're seeing all this um, stimulus money that is going to people that may not need it. I would love for them to have an opportunity to put that money, if they don't need it, into helping those that do. Um, certainly, you can, you know, people do that in supporting our organization, but um, but I can't help but wonder if there's other ways, or you know, people may not be in dire, like at the bottom, where there there maybe is more help, but you know, just need a little bit extra money to get that last first last in security money. They don't maybe need an array of services, but if they just had that one chunk of money to get them into housing, their their job and their stability would keep them afloat. But um, it, I think, also there's there's times when people are the most need get get need, but a lot of people get lost in the middle, um, and that's that's always a concern is how to help people that are are not at the very bottom. But, but we'll slip into the bottom if they don't have some support. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you for the questions. And um, I think, um, sadly, we're not gonna be able to solve all of this tonight, but I think it's really profoundly wonderful that we're actually having this deeper conversation about um, you know, housing security in general, but in, more in particular for me uh, around our houseless folks and that, um, that there are a range of services that are out there and that people are accessing and, um, and um, very passionate and courageous work is going on, but it's also not enough because we're, there's some missing pieces and gaps in uh, pulling things together to make it, make life, um, functional for, for some people. And, um, and I'm completely committed to continuing that ongoing conversation as I'm sure all of my colleagues are. And, um, and I also, I, I wanna do a shout out to the mayor's office for, uh, for all of the work they've done, quietly coordinating a lot of this that, um, that the, you know, we, we've been talking about case managing or just who, who nudges people in the right direction? And it's often through our mayor's office. That's the, one of the functions of being the, the point person, the point office for the city. Um, so 
And I also want to acknowledge that we're, we've run over our time here. Um, I usually don't want to do that, but this has just been really important conversation. Um, and I want to head out. I want to get to closing out the meeting. Um, I, I'm, I was going to read a proposed ordinance into the record in this meeting. I am going to skip that. Um, I'm just going to let everybody know that next month's community resources meeting will be considering uh, zoning language to make it easier for, um, for affordable housing to come to Northampton. And that uh, it's an in the weeds kind of legal thing. Uh, Carolyn Mish will be at the meeting to join us. Everybody is welcome back for that. And that, um, and that I, I look forward to continuing this conversation. I wanna thank everybody for coming tonight, uh, especially the speakers, just real tremendous work going on. And, um, and with that, I'd like to have a motion to adjourn so people can go eat dinner. And I think we do need to do it for both meetings. Yes, so I, I'd like to hear a motion. Aaron, to do both. Community I was going to say, I'm on both committees. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> move to adjourn. <laughs> okay, so we have a motion to adjourn. I got a second. 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 Okay. Uh, no discussion for this. And so, Laura, roll call for uh, community resources. Oh, Laura, you're muted. Laura's muted and she can't unmute. Oh, this is- Sorry, I just have time to manage. That would have been an interesting thing. <laughs> can't end. <laughs> Councillor Nash. Yeah. Uh, yes. Counsel Councillor Foster. Yes. And Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Okay, and now I hand it over to my, my colleague on city services. I'm going a river next to my base, so it might take you all the way down there. Uh, what is that? <laughs> it sound like <laughs> nice uh, Bart, can I make a motion to adjourn city services? Second. Second. Karen Foster. Okay. All in favor? Yes. Yes. Ah, roll call. Okay. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Your roll call on it. Sure. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Foster. No, Councillor Maori. Yes. <laughs> Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Okay, momentarily blanking on the other one is uh, that's me. That's Councillor Foster. Oh, <laughs> yes. Did we get everybody? Yes. Yeah. Oh, so we're adjourned. Good night, everybody. Thanks. Thank you all very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor.